Welcome to lecture two, um, intro introduction to selections and the Boolean data type. So I'm going to introduce the selection, the type of selections we have in Java and um, also introduce the Boolean data type. But before we do that, I'm going to need to install the to, to, to sort of recap on how to install the IDE in integrated development environment and uh, the JDK. So before we install anything else, we need to start that we need to download the JDK. So I'm going to type download Java. Uh, JDK Oracle. Um, and then I'm going to click on the first link. And then you're going to see that there's different versions of Java. So we're going to install the latest one. The latest one is Java 21. So I'm going to download that one. So if you want to install an, an older version, you just click on the older version. So let's say you wanted to install JDK 17. You just click on JDK 17. But I want to install the latest one, which is JDK 21. So I'm going to click on JDK 21. And then I'm going to click on the operating system that I'm using. I'm using Windows operating system, so I'm going to click on Windows. And then there's three ways, um, OK, two ways to install the JDK. You can download the executable and then run the executable, and then it should, it's, it should install the JDK and set the path, and everything should be done automatically. Or you can um, download the zipped file and then unzip it and then add it to your C drive and then set the path. So I'm going to do it the old way. I'm going to download the binary, the zip file. I've already have I've already downloaded them um, before the class. So as you can see, there's the zip file here. So you're just going to click it there and then you should start downloading here. But I already have it, so I'm not going to download it again. Come on, OK, I'm going to cancel it and then. I'm going to download Eclipse, right? So I'm going to go here and say download Eclipse. And then I'm going to click on the very first link. Eclipse downloads. And then we're just going to download the latest Eclipse. So I'm just going to click here and click download. It should redirect me to the next page. After it redirects me to the next page, um, I'm going to see another download uh, download button and then I'm going to click the download button or you can also just click here. Either way is fine. And then after you've downloaded and it is finished downloading, you should have the executable. So let's start with the. The, the JDK. So before we set up the JDK, I'm going to open my terminal, uh, the command prompt, and I'm just going to run a few commands. I want to check if Java is already installed in here. As you can see, it says Java is not direct, is not recognized as an internal or external command. Uh, operable program or batch file. So that means we do not have Java installed inside our operating system, right? So we're going to install it. So I'm going to unzip that zipped file. So I'm going to right click and select extract all and then click extract. And then it's going to extract. Let's just wait patiently for it to extract. So it's extracting 40% complete. Let's just wait for it patiently. While it's loading. And then it's done unzipping, so I'm going to OK, let me just close this. So there's the unzipped file, right? So. So there's the unzipped file here. So I'm going to double click and go inside the unzipped file. Okay, let me do put it down here. 
So you should have the JDK uh, uh, JDK dash um, 21.0.2, right? And then I'm going to click on that folder once and then I'm going to cut it or just copy it, whatever method works for you. And then I'm going to scroll down and go to my C drive and then double click on my C drive. And then after clicking on my C drive, I'm going to paste the JDK. So I'm just going to right click. OK. OK, let me remove the magnifier. So I'm just going to right click and paste. So it's not showing. Don't know why, but OK. So I'm just going to press Control V to paste, right? So Control V to paste. There's the JDK. It has been added, but we haven't set the path yet. So what do we mean by setting the path? Setting the path is basically telling the computer where the JDK is located so that when I try to call, like when I try to use commands like Java or Java C or Java P, it should know where they are located. So they're located inside the bin folder. So in order for me to tell it where they are located, I'm going to double click on the JDK folder and then double click in the binary folder. And then if we scroll down, you should see uh, magnifier. Let me open the magnifier. You should see there's the Java C. And then if you scroll down, there's Java exe, and then there's Java P. So I want to tell it where they are located so that when I use the Java C or Java P or Java command, it knows what I'm talking about. So I'm going to click on the top there and then copy that um, that path. So C drive JDK dash 21.0.2 uh, backslash bin. So that's that's where you should find that's that's where you should be able to locate the 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 commands that I'm going to use to run and compile my Java applications. So I'm going to close and then I'm going to use press the Windows uh, uh, icon and then on my keyboard and then I'm going to type environment. The moment you before you even finish typing environment, it should show you this section um, edit the system environment variable. So I'm going to press enter and then click on environment variables and then click on path and then click edit. I've already added the the bin. What, what, so let me just delete it. So let's say you didn't it, you haven't added. It's not there yet, right? So you're going to click new and then you're going to paste control V or you can just right click and say paste and paste that um, path that you copied and then click OK and then click OK again and then click OK again. So now you've set the the Java path. So let's test if it is now working or Java. Let's test to see if Java is now recognized in our operating system. So I'm going to open the terminal and then I'm going to type um, Java. Uh, dash dash version. There we go. Now it recognizes what I mean by Java. Java C dash dash version. You see now it knows what I'm talking about. Then I can just exit my terminal. So now we are done with setting up the JDK. So now Java is recognized. In our operating system, so I'm going to go to the downloads folder and then now I should I want to run the Eclipse executable file to install Eclipse. So we're going to wait for it to load. Wait, let's just wait for it to load. And then we're going to install. So since we are done installing the JDK, I can just delete the uh, the, the zip folder and the unzipped folder that I had in my downloads folder. I can just delete them. There's no use anymore. And this executable file. So there's my Eclipse installer. And then I'm going to say I'm going to click on the first on the first one Eclipse IDE for Java developers because we are learning Java. And we are, we are not working for any company yet, right? So we can choose enterprise. We are not making applications for a company. 
We're just learning Java, basic Java. So we're going to install the basic IDE for Java. Eclipse IDE for Java developers. Just click on it once. And then here you need to select your, J your JDK. If you leave it like this, it's going to try to do re download it from, from this website online. So we don't want that. We already have it set, set up in our operating system. So I'm going to click this folder icon, which say it says select a Java virtual machine. So let's select it. So I'm going to click browse. I don't want to download it because I already downloaded it. So I need to locate my JDK folder. There it is. So we just click on it once. It's going to find and set everything else. So you just need to click on it once. So that it knows which folder and where is it located. If you check here at the top, it's located inside the C drive and I want the JDK folder. And then I'm going to click select folder. Then it's going to load and then it's going to say one new virtual machine found. Then you know if it says this, then you know you've, you've done the correct thing and you're good to go. And then you click OK. There it is. It's now showing there. It's now showing the version two, and it shows what type of what type it is. It's a JDK, Java Development Kit, and then OK, and then it should show. It should change here. You see now it's it's locate it's locating the JDK from my C drive, which is what we wanted to do. I don't want it. To, I don't want it to create a desktop shortcut, so I'm just gonna remove that. I just want, but it has to have a start start menu in, or else you can't search and run. Uh, the IDE, you'd have to always go inside the file explorer. So I'm going to leave the create start menu entry and then click install. And then I'm going to accept the terms and conditions. And then we're going to wait for it to install. So while it installs, let's let's recap on data types, right? So remember we talked about data types. We talked about byte, short, int, long, float, um, double, and char. But with with char and strings, we gonna get in. We're gonna we're gonna get into those data types when we get there. So I don't want to talk about them. I don't want to introduce characters. I just want to teach you. I just want to show you the basics of characters. But we'll go in depth. When you talk about when you do the when you talk about the string data type, so I'm gonna create new and then blank, and then I'm gonna make it a vector image, and then I'm gonna say create, and then downloads, and then I'm just gonna name it test. Just gonna give it a simple name. Um, there we go. So if you remember what, when you talked about data types. So you might ask yourself, why do we have so many data types? Why do I have so many variations of the integer data type? So why do I have byte? Let me change the language settings to Java so that it can, it can highlight. So why do I have byte? Why do I have short? Why do I have int? Why do I have long? If all of them at the end of the day are of type integer, why do we have to have different variations of the integer data type? So we need to have different variations because of our problem statements, right? So when you're creating or when you're solving a problem by creating an application, some data types are applicable in some scenarios and, and some data types are not. So the main goal you can, the thing you can view, the way you can view uh, these data types is that each data type has specific um, limitations and these limitations are in terms of its length. So the byte, it 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 carries um it carries um a byte is basically eight bits, eight binary digits. So remember, bit stands for binary digits. So it stands for it it, it can it stores um a max of eight bits. So what integer can we represent? So we can represent an integer up to two to the power of se of seven, which is just basically eight minus one. Uh, minus one, so this should give you 128. So we can represent an, integ an integer up to 128. So you see, the byte is very useful if your maximum values are not going to exceed 128. Then you can use the byte data type. So 
you can view this. I, I, I like to use this um, this analogy um, for data for these data types. Like, why do we have so many data types? So I'm gonna use this analogy. So you can view um, this this data types in terms of in terms of like something like this. So you can think maybe the you can view the biotes in terms of let's say it's 500 milliliters. And then short is like 500 liters and then int is like one liter and then long is like the biggest one two liter so you can view it in, in terms of this way all of them are containers they can contain they contain the same thing which is that liquid it could be it could be milk it could be a uh, beverage it could be anything so let's view it in terms of bev beverages. So let's say um, these are containers of Coca-Cola. So obviously you can get the 350 milliliters um, can. You can also get 500 milliliters um, bottle. Then you can also have the one liter and there's also the two liter. So you can view these data types in in terms of like different different sizes. So let's say you have a you, you have a family, right? It would make sense for you to choose the bigger one, which is the two liter, because you want to make sure everyone in the family gets gets their share. So that's why we have the data type long. When we have to deal with um, when we are making very big applications and we're going to have very big values. So long, you can see longs and integer types. These two types, they you can use them uh, on in applications like banking banking systems and the banking app or gaming when you're gaming and um for example your your wallet you know when you're gaming like let's say for example yeah it's a you're playing a game like gta obviously you're gonna make money you're gonna collect money on missions and things like that so you're gonna need to have to use an inti at least an integer up to a long so as you can see, data, different data types are applicable to different scenarios and different pro problem statements. So as I said, these data types, you can view them as like they, they, are, they have different measurements, they have different sizes. So if you want a one liter, you can use an integer. If you want a two liter, the biggest one, you can use a long. If you want something for now, you can use a short, which you, which you can view in terms of like 500 milliliters. Oh, you want the smallest one, the bite. Yeah, for example, you're alone and you just want something to drink now. You can't buy a two liter. You, it wouldn't make any sense. I mean, there's people who do that, but like like really, you, you wouldn't want to buy a two liter because you just want something to drink now and finish now. I'm, I promise you, you're not going to finish that two liter now. You'd have to divide it, drink, drink it up in, 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 diff, in smaller portions. Uh, so it would be reasonable to, to use a short or a bite. Depends. So that you, that's when you'd use a bite or a short. But if you have a family, you have a big family, minimum has to be two lead. So you have to use long. So you see the different data types are applicable to different scenarios because they have different sizes. So with short, it stores 16 bits. Going to be 2 to the power of 16 minus 1. And then integer, it stores 32 bits, which is just going to be 2 to the power of 31, or basically 2 to the power of 32 minus 1. And this one's going to be bits. And as you can see, on each turn, the, the size doubles. So the byte from, from byte to short, we've, we've doubled. We have twice the, sp the space. Integer, from short to integer, we have 32, which is twice as which is twice um, which is twice the the size of the short data type and when you get to long from into long it's twice the integer data type as you can see 64 is basically 32 times 2 right so you can view it like that there's different sizes and there's different scenarios of which these data types are applicable to and you should be aware that when you since there's the, these data types have limits. If you try to store 129, remember I told you it stores 128. If you try to store 129, something very special is going to happen. So let's launch 
the, the IDE. So I'm going to alternate. I'm going to switch between the, the Eclipse IDE and my draw.io. So just always just click this button, say use this as the default and do not ask again so that it doesn't ha you don't have it doesn't have to keep asking you every time you launch the Eclipse IDE. So let's wait for it for it to load. It's loading, it's loading. So remember that when you talked about data types, I think I also did demonstrate. There's different sizes. This could be 350 liters. Then you would have 500 liters. Then you'd also have one liter. And then you'd also have um, two liters. So different data types are applicable to different scenarios. So I'm going to close this. So this is how it looks. The, this is how the Eclipse IDE looks the first time you, you use it. So, so you want to cancel the welcome page. You don't want it to always open when you're opening your ID. These parts, you you barely gonna use them. You usually these parts are usually used when you are now a professional. So I'm just gonna minimize the sides, minimize again. So I want it to be simplistic. So there's my Eclipse IDE. So I'm gonna say create a Java project, and then I'm gonna call it. Um, Hello world. Yeah, I'm just going to call it hello world. And then just make sure you don't include this. Don't create a module in for the Java file. It's going to cause issues with you creating your application and adding your classes and stuff. So you're going to click next and then click finish. By default, it's going to it's going to have a source folder. Source folder, that's where all your source code goes to. And then before we do anything else, I'm going to create a main class. So I'm going to right click and then go to new and then scroll down and say class because I want to create a class. So remember Java is object oriented, so everything needs to be within a class. So I'm going to create a main class. I'm going to call it main. OK, it says the use of default package is discouraged. We're going to ignore that for now. And then I'm going to since it's a since it's a uh, main class, it needs to have a main function. So I'm going to add. When it look at this question, which method uh, stubs would you like to create? So which methods would you like to add to your class? I would like to add the main method. Comments don't click, create generic comments. We're going to create the comments on our own and then just create click finish. And then there we go. And then to I'm going to minimize this. You can always put it back and just press here. No, you can just press here and then it's going to come back, but I'm going to minimize it. I'm also going to minimize the bottom part and then to zoom in, right? It's control plus. That's how you zoom in. So control plus. There we go. I've zoomed in. And then. Let's talk. Let's. Do it. Let's refresh on data types, right? So our data types, um, we're talking about byte, right? So let me show you the byte data type. So byte, let's say you are using the byte to store the age, right? So age and it's 128, right? That's the maximum that you can store in a byte. It's 128. Mm, so yeah, it makes sense. So with the byte, I don't know why it's doing this, but yeah, you'd you, you'd have to cast it to a byte. Yeah. So re remember um, what I said about Java in the previous um, videos. For example, when you write a number, right, like a double, when you say it, it, a number with a decimal point, automatically it's converted to a double. To a double. If you want to make it a float you'd have to put that suffix f the smaller small letter f or upper case or uh, upper letter or uppercase letter f so same applies with, with integer by default it's going to use the integer data type so we'd have to cast it to a byte 
So this is how you cast. Remember, casting just means convert something to be something else. So I'm just converting from this integer type to a byte data type. And um, let's, let's, let's just talk about a bit about con uh, casting. So casting, right, there's two terms, there's two different types of casting, right? There's narrowing and widening. So narrowing, as it as it's as it says, as, it, as the word says, um, as the word says, narrowing. You are narrowing down the data type. So this is when you, in our example, I'm converting from int to byte, right? Remember, integer is it is it's bigger than a byte. So if I cast from an integer which is a big which is bigger than a byte and I can't, I'm not trying to cast back to it to a, to a byte from I'm, I'm casting from int to a byte that means I'm narrowing down because I'm reducing it to to it was able to store 32 bits now I'm going to reduce it to to only be able to store 8 bits so as you can see 32 has been reduced to 8 so we've narrowed down that type so this is the type of casting that we call narrowing. This is narrowing because we are reducing from one type to another type. To, we are reducing from a, a type with a wider range to a type with a smaller range. Then there's widening. Widening is done is done um, implicitly by the computer. So it's done automatically by Java. So for example, I have an int, right? And let's say I want to store it into a variable new age. I want to take that age and store it into a new age. This is small, this is eight bits. But I'm trying to store it into something that's that is that that is that stores a maximum of 32 bits. So now I've I've widened the the range. So this is what we call widening because it went from only storing a maximum of eight bits to be able to store a maximum of 32 bits. I've made it wider. I've widened the range for for that um, for that date for that uh, variable. So this is done implicitly. Implicitly just means automatically by Java, and then this should be done explicitly and explicitly what's the opposite of automatically is just manually so that's done manually that's why I, I manually write the code to cast there is the cast to a byte so let's output um the age right so system dot out dot print line and then i'm going to output age right and then, okay, I think it should be able to run. Yeah, there it is, there's the, no, it's it's not 128, it's 127. Yeah, it's 127. It, it can store a maximum of 127, not 128. I made a mistake there. So let's run it again. It should show 127, there's the 127. So the question is, what happens when you go outside the range? Remember the maximum of the byte is 127. What happens if I add one to the age? So I just say age is equals to age plus one, right? Let's say I do something like this, but then remember I have to cast, cast the one to a byte again, which is gonna be very annoying, but yeah, you have to cast the one to a, to a byte again. Oh, okay, yeah, now, now, I, now I remember. So to keep it simple, right? I'm just gonna do this. I'm gonna say age plus equals one, right? In this way, I'm gonna explain. I'm gonna go in depth how, what 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 this line of code that I've highlighted means in Java. So we have that. So what happens is that it's gonna go back to the minimum. Remember that um, this is the maximum that I can store. If I add one, 128 cannot be stored within age because age is, is of type byte and byte can store only eight bits, which is basically 
the maximum, they can store a maximum in maximum integer number of 127. So what happens if I go beyond the maximum? So what happens is that it just goes, it just takes you back to the minimum. So since you're out of range, it 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 uh, reinitializes the age variable to the minimum, which is going to be negative 128. There we go. It re it um okay let me do this. Yeah. So it it reduced it 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 went back to the minimum that a byte can store because I've exceeded the maximum. So that's. That it, it also applies for every other data type, your short, your int, your long. In order, if you go beyond the maximum for that data type, the maximum range for that data type, it resizes it to the minimum value of that data type. So we are a bit familiar with data types now, and we know that these bytes, shorts, ints, and longs, it's different variations of the integer data type. Basically, it's different different ranges of the integer data type. So let me remove this. And let's talk about um, let's talk about um, selections, right? So let's talk about selections. I was just recapping on data types so that we are all familiar with what data types are. And remember, a data type is just a container. If you remember in your math class, when you said x is equals to 10, right? What this means, right? This line of code, what this means. It means that, remember everything in your computer is stored inside your memory, right? There's, uh, there's a secondary storage, then there's, uh, which is non-volatile and things like that. If you read your textbook, you should be able to get those terms. Um, so volatility just means um, the, the ability of that storage uh, container to be able to continue um, when there's no presence of electricity. So secondary storage, remember that's your hard drive, um, your SSDs, your, your your memory stick, all those things. They are called secondary storage and they are non-volatile. When we say they're non-volatile, we mean that even when you switch off your laptop, you don't lose the contents or the things that are stored inside that storage container. But with things like RAM, which are very volatile, it means that after I've switched off the laptop, I would have to, whatever was in the RAM um, storage is gonna disappear. So that's why I remember every every application like Eclipse, Notepad, every application that you run is taken from the hard drive to the RAM, and then it's run, it's run, it's it's run on it's run via the RAM, the random access memory. So that's why when you switch off your laptop, if I switch off my laptop right now and I'm currently running running Eclipse, when I switch it back on, Eclipse won't be running anymore. Why is that? Because Eclipse was running inside my RAM and my RAM is volatile, meaning that if there's no electricity, everything that was running inside the RAM stops running, it disappears. So if you remember when you talked about variables, right? Variables, it's like a box, right? A variable is like a box. It's like a box or there's many ways you can view it. It's like a box box um, with a cat inside. So it's like a box, right? Just like this cat. You see this cat over here? This cat is inside a box. So you can view the variables as like, we create, we are telling the com computer to create a box, sort of a, some, a container, like a box, that's gonna contain something within it. And we give it a label, right? So let me try to demonstrate these variables. Let me open paint. I hope I'll be able to demonstrate this thing. Let me see. I'm not quite familiar with this application. Um, let me see. Let's say. Okay, let me see. So let me try and draw. 
So you can imagine that there's a box, right? There's this box. There's the box. Let me do this. So there's the box, right? OK, let me do this so that it's clear. So there's the box, right? So what happens when you create a variable, right? Like this. There's, there's, um, there's, how many things? I'd say there's three things, right? There's the data type, meaning what type of data can this box contain, or what type of things can this box store? Then it has a label, which is the variable name or the variable, and it has the certain operations that you can do on that variable. You can either add to that variable or subtract, or you can't subtract, or this, you know, there's operations that you can do to that variable. So if I say byte like this, right, and I say byte, can I just use int? If I say int x is equals to 100, right? What this translates to is telling me, is me telling the computer, okay, listen here, I want you to create a container, a box, right? And it's going to store this data type or this type of data. Remember data type, you can read it vice versa, type of data. What type of data can I store? Can I store numbers? Can I store characters? Can I store this and that? You see, that's what type of data type means. So it's going to have a data type. The computer will be like, oh, so you want to work with integers. That means you want to store a maximum of approximately. Yeah, it's approximately. It's approximately 2 billion. So you want to store an integer up to 2 billion, right? That's what you're telling the computer because it knows the maximum for each data type. And you're giving it, you're assigning a value inside the inside the box. So what happens is that the computer goes there, it's like, oh, so let me create a box. So there's the box here. Give it a label. I'm going to call it X. There, there is X. And I'm going to put a value of 10 inside or 100. So inside, it's going to go a value of 100. So inside this box, a value of a value of 100 is going to be stored. And in the next line, if I update this value, right? If I say X is equals to X plus one, something like this, right? What I mean is go to this location. Remember what happens is that you always, it always um, evaluates the expression on the right hand side, and then it stores it. You can see with the um, assignment operator, it stores it inside this variable or label or, or container with or container with that label. So what what this means like take the value, extract the value, the current value, which is what hundred, and add a one to it, and then store the answer back into the same container. So what happens is that it's going to take this hundred value, and then it's going to add a one, and then this is going to be hundred and one. So this 101 is becomes the new value. And then this one, the, the 100 that we previously had is now going to disappear. So let me. OK, didn't go as planned. How do you erase? This is an eraser though. How, how is it? Why is it erasing like this? Yeah, ne? but this is basically what it means. So now what's going to happen is it's going to create a new box here. A new box here. It's not a new box, it's the same box, but now this box now has a value of 101. So this box has been updated. It now has a value of 101. So that's what you are doing when you're creating variables. So just keep that in mind. 
so we are done with talking about variables. So now I want to talk about just always think of this cat when you think of variables. So now I want to talk about um, OK, I might need paint. Mm, OK, I'll just open it when I need it. Don't save. And then I'm going to close this. So let's talk about selections, right? So we're going to talk about selections. So let's say that you want your applications to only take positive values. How would you do that? It becomes tricky now. So remember how you get input. You create a scanner object. Let's call it scan. And then new scanner. And then it's, con it's supposed to take in an input device. And then just import the package. Um, it's supposed to take in an input device or an input stream. So we want the one that takes an input stream. You can also take a string that it, it you can also take a string. This is the string is, apl is applicable when you're reading from the from file. So let's put in a input stream. So remember the system dot in refers to the input stream. You see it's an input stream instance or an input stream object. So now I've referred to my terminal. So this is gonna capture any input. It's gonna scan for any input that that's entered by the user via the terminal. So let's read in an integer, right? Let's say I want to read in a number and it has to be a positive number. So read in a positive number. So I'm gonna use the object, the scan object, scan dot next integer, next int like this. So what, the, what happens is you refer, this refers to the input stream, right? The command line. So on the command line, scan and then scan for the next integer that you're going to find. And then after storing the integer, I'm going to output the integer. So the integer that is the user's enter is number. And then don't notice, don't forget to close the scan scanner plus. So let's close it. You can just say scan dot close. You don't necessarily need to do it, but because at the, at the end of the day, by the time it reaches this uh, Kelly braces, it's going to close. So let me run it. You should wait for my input. Because I'm getting input from, I didn't output any text, which is very bad, but. Okay, why isn't it loading? Why isn't it loading? Uh, just give me a sec, navigate. Um, okay, let me do this. I don't know why it's not running. So I'm gonna right click, right -click on my main Java file and then click run as a Java application. Let's see. Mm. Or maybe it wants me to. OK, I, I think it doesn't want me to close that, but it should load. It shouldn't show, shouldn't be showing me any issues. OK, so let me just do this. Let me print the number 18. Let's see if. How come it's not showing the? Why is not showing my terminal now? Already running. OK, so I think it wants me to. Where's the? I think it wants me to open the terminal. The navigate, I think it's go to. OK, it's not. Uh, just give me a sec. Um, where's the terminal now? 
Um, okay, not reflect. I don't want to reflect. Edit. Okay. There is here. Okay. So I'm just going to leave it there because it seems like now it's going to give me problems. So let me put back that number and then let me close all those instances that we're running. I don't know why it didn't. It should open. Even if I close, I minimize this. It, sh it, sh it should open. Okay, nothing is running at the moment. There we go. Now it's running. Um, um, let's enter a number. Let's say 1000. Right. There we go. It's, it displayed the value back to me. So what if I enter? What if I enter a negative value, negative 100? You see, it is accepting the negative 100, which is a problem because we set our application. We've set our application not to accept, we want it not to accept any negative values. How do we do that? So the way we do that is we have to make use of selections. So the first set of selections is a single if statement. Statement. So we're going to start with a single if statement. So remember what an if statement is. It basically states that if a certain condition is met, then do the following. So what's the syntax for it? So it's if, and then here we're going to have a Boolean expression. And then we're going to do something here. So if this condition is met, then do this. So that's how it works. So it looks at a specific Boolean expression. So now the question is, what is the Boolean expression? How do we represent the Boolean expression? Before we show how we represent the Boolean expression, let's talk about the Boolean data type. So we have a data type called Boolean. Boolean basically stores um, true or false. So I would say is positive, right? Remember, we're dealing, we dealing with an application that only accepts positive numbers. So Boolean is positive, right? So I can either set it to true or I can set it to false. So at this point in time it's false. We we are not sure. We can't just assume that it's positive when we haven't checked the number. So this is how you can declare it. You might ask yourself, what does Boolean mean? Boolean basically, the keyword Boolean, it came from the creator of uh, Boolean logic. It was his name was George Bo. So you can see he invented true or false. That a statement can either be true or a statement can either be false. It can either be true or false. One of one of the two. It can, it can it can't be both. It can be in the middle. So he invented the Boolean Boolean logic, right? So they named it. They named the Boolean data type after him. You see, bool. There's bool. If you just add um, a n, it becomes boolean. You see boolean. So that's where it originated from. So we have our boolean is positive. So we now know if it's false, we can just represent. We can use false. If it's true, we can just say it's true. So this data type only has two values: true or false. So how can we, um, now the question is, how can we check if a number is positive? If you remember in your math class, so let me just open my paint app. So if you remember in your math class, right, we had operators like greater than or equals to, less than or equals to, we also had um, equals to, we also had, um, what's that? I'll just start that one. Um, not equals to, which is this. We, If you remember your math class, you had all these operators, greater than equals to, less than equals to, equals to, not equals to. We also have the same inside the, inside Java. So 
how do you write them in Java? So the way I write them in Java, greater than or equals to this, you write it like this. You write it like greater than, and then you put followed by an equals sign because we can't represent this symbol in type by typing the characters on the keyboard. So the only way we can mimic it is by combining the greater than and the equal symbol. So how do you write less than equals to? It becomes very clear to understand. Less than equals to, you just use the less than symbol and the equals sign. And then the not equals to one, um, this one not equals to, you represent it like this. You say not, you put the exclamation mark there and followed by an equals, an equals sign, which translates to not equals to. And you can also have uh, less than, greater than, less than symbols. So let's test them out. So whenever I use these symbols, right, the greater than equals to, less than equals to, greater than, and less than, and not equals to, they always evaluate to a Boolean. So remember, we talked about a Boolean, it's true or false. That means they always evaluate to a true or false. So if you check here, let me output here. So output, um, output the number and check if the number is greater than zero. So this, this is going to return the Boolean expression, a Boolean value, which means true or false. So let's test it out. So if the user typed a value greater than zero, should output true. If it's less than zero, should output false. So I ran my, I ran my application. So let me do this. There, there is it's running, so let me enter a negative value, right? And as you can see, it's showing up, it's showing what false. Because remember, what I said if you use these operators greater than, if you use less than, if you use greater than or equals to, if you use less than or equals to, use um, equals to, you use um, not equals to, you're gonna get a boolean value, which is true or false. In this case, I typed a negative value, so it makes sense for it to be false because the number negative 100 is not greater than zero. So let's run it again. Let me enter a positive value this time. Let's say 90. And then the output is what? True. So as you can see, it always returns a value of true and false. So which is exactly what we want since we are working with, we are going to be doing selections. I forgot to, check, to do this symbol. The equal sign, the way it's represented in Java, it's two equals two equal signs. So that it you it, it, it you differentiate it from the assignment operator. Remember this equal sign, it assigns. It says take what take what's on the left hand side and store it into a box with this label. That's what it means if the single equal sign. If it's two, it means that uh, you are checking equality. Is the left hand side equal to the right hand side? So let me show you. So let's say we are looking, we want the user to enter a value of 100. So I can use two equal sign. I'm checking if whatever value is on the left hand side, is it equal to whatever value that's on the right hand side? And if whatever, if it's true, then return the true value. If it's false, then return false. So let's run our application. So I'm going to enter a value of a thousand, which is not, which is going to be false, right? A thousand is not equals to hundred. So the left hand side is not equals to the right hand side. So the, therefore the answer should be false. And then there we go. As expected, it's going to return false. And then I'm going to run it again and then enter the required value, which is a hundred. Now hundred is equals to a hundred. So left hand side is equals to right hand side. Therefore, it should, it's true. That statement becomes true. So it's going to return a true, a truth value of true. So there's the true, truth value of true. So as you can see, that's how you can use um, translate the operators from Java to, from math to Java. And it works exactly the same way. So we have this, 
So now let's test out. Let's let's only take, let's only store the, you see here, let's only take, let's only output the value if it's positive, right? So remember we are writing this, we're saying is equals to zero, is equals to what, what? This returned the Boolean, right? It returned true or false. So I can copy that and put it inside the conditional part. Remember, this is the condition that needs to be met. If that condition is true, which is basically a Boolean expression, if that condition is true, then execute what's underneath that if statement. So what condition you want to check? If it's equals to zero, if it goes to 100, let's say you want the user to, to, get, to guess, maybe it's a guess game. They need to guess. If it's equals to 100, then you'd say their guess was correct, something like that. So I'm going to remove this. And then I'm going to put Kelly braces. What Kelly braces do, right? Kelly braces just simply state that package this. This is within this if statement, this if statement. It's part of that if statement. Um, I will explain when to omit because you can also omit the Kelly braces. Let's just quickly solve this problem. So remember this part, it needs to return a true or false. And we did discuss and you did see that using these symbols, less than, not equals to, greater than or equals to, less than or equals to, greater than, less than, they all return a value of true or false. So now I know that when I put this condition there, it's gonna return true or false. So if the number that, that I've received from the user, as you can see, I've got, I got this value from the command line. If that value that I've gotten from the user is equals to 100, then I should say correct. I would say, um, um, I would, I'll just output um, your guess is correct, something like that. So system dot out. So I'm sure you, you're really tired of having to type all of these things over and over. So there's a shortcut. You can just say sys out and then press control backspace. It's going to auto complete for you. So there we go, control backspace, and it auto completed for me. I don't have to keep typing it over and over. So system dot out of print line, um, I should say um, your guess is correct. And then perfect. But if you're gonna get to more more if state more uh more different more different um levels of selections, right? So let me click run. So there's my application. I ran my application, right? So let me get, let me guess the number. So let's say I enter eight. Hmm, interesting. You see the problem here, it doesn't output anything if I enter the incorrect value. We're gonna fix that. Let's out, let's put in the correct guess. Let's say 100. And wow, it says your guess is correct. Because it used, it, it checked the Boolean condition. It checked if the left hand side is, is, is exactly the same as what's on the right hand side. Remember when you, when you, uh, when you reference or you use the variable name, what you're saying, what you're telling the computer is go to a box with a label number and take the value inside that box and compare it with this literal. If if you write the value as it is inside a program, it's called a literal. This is an integer literal. It's literally an integer. That's what it means. We have string literals. We have double literals. Literally a double, literally a string. That's what it means. So we have this, but then you saw the problem with our application at the moment. It can't say your guess is incorrect. Let's say enter an incorrect guess, nine. It does nothing, no output. So that's where the else comes into place. So remember the if condition, it says, if this is true, basically what this means, if this is true, then execute these statements. Execute these statements. So if this part is true, or it returns the truth value of true, then execute whatever is within the if statement. And then here, I'm just going to put back number is equals to 100. 
So this is the else statement, right? Else what it means, it means if this wasn't true. So that means it's the false. So remember this part um, executes when condition is true or the condition is met. So basically this condition is true. That, therefore, I'm going to execute this part. Else means executes or execute when condition is false or condition is not met. So if you if this isn't the case, so therefore the value that I've received is not a hundred, then this else part is going to execute that part. It's going to handle that situation. So I'm going to say sys out and then I'm going to say your guess is incorrect. So there we go. Um, so if this condition is true, then execute this part. Else, it means that this was not met. This condition was false. So basically, we didn't get the value, the value of 100 from the user. So else, execute this part. Your guess is incorrect. So let's run it. So run. To see if it's running, you're going to see this red button. You see, if you say terminate, that means that your application is currently running. So let me enter a value. Let's, en let's enter a thousand. You see, now it's working perfectly fine. I entered the wrong guess. It says your, your guess is incorrect. So let me run it again. And then let me enter 100. It says your guess is correct. So now it's working for both cases, right? We've handled both cases. So since we've handled both cases, we've we've become aware of the different um, this if statement. It's an if else statement. This is now this was now an if else statement, right? So this is how an if else statement looks. So um, let's see. Uh, OK, so what should I introduce now? So now I should talk about, um, OK, the when should you omit curly braces? Curly braces, you can omit them only if you have a single statement within the for loop. So let me re remove this comment because now it's two, two lines. So if you have exactly one line within a if statement, you can omit the curly braces. So I can do this. And then omit this too. As you can see, now it's more, I don't know, it's, it's, it makes much more sense. But the, if you write code like this, it's more error prone. You're prone to make a lot of errors. So you should Try, you should just try to avoid writing it this way, but just know it exists. If you want to, you can write it this way. If you have, if you exactly if you have exactly one statement or one line within the condition, if I had another one here, if I say this out like this, you see now it's gonna have issues because there's two lines. So now I have to put the Kelly braces. So just keep that in mind. If you have one line or one statement within the if statement, you can omit the Kelly braces. Let's run it. You see it's going to work exactly the same way. So let me enter 100. Your case is correct, right? And then let's run it again. And then let me enter 1,000. Your guess is incorrect. It works exactly the same way. So this is the different way to write the if statement. Then we go, we're going to have um, nested if statements, right? So you can also nest if statements, right? So let's talk about nested if statements. So nested if statements is basically an if statement within an if statement. So you can have if number, something like this, if number is greater than zero, yeah, I can have something like this and then else. If number is greater than zero, then we know the number is positive, right? 
if it's not, then we're just going to say um, number cannot be negative. Negative. Yeah, just a simple application. I just want to demonstrate nested if statement. You see, within this if statement, if this condition is met, it's true. If I have a positive number, then I can check if the number is what equals to 100. Remember, this is our guessing game. If it's equals to 100, and then I'm going to say sys out like this, and then I should say your guess is correct. Okay, let me zoom out a bit. You should say your guess is correct, else sys out your guess is incorrect. So as you can see, I can have nested if statements. You see, there's an if, and then within that if, there's another if statement. So if you have something of this nature, we call them nested if statements. And you can have even more nested if statements. It doesn't stop here. You can have as many if statements as you want. So notice the difference here. I added curly braces because I have more than one line within this if statement. But for the else part, I don't necessarily need them, right? I can just remove them. I can just leave it like this. OK, I can just do it like this. Yeah, it should work perfectly fine. But then you see, look at my if statement. It looks very untidy, man. It looks there's a lot going on here. So I'm just going to do this, undo, and then leave it like this. In this way, it's better. Yeah, this way it's a bit better. I can you can read it a bit better. It's easy to read. And then I'm going to run my application and then open my terminal. And then let's say enter a negative value, right? You should say the number cannot be negative, right? We've dealt, we've executed the else part, but let's say my number is positive. It's positive and it's 40, but it's, it's still not the right guess. Remember, it's a guessing game. Let me enter for it. The number is positive, but my guess was wrong. You see, it did work. So the inner if statement, you see this if statement within, you see this if statement within this one, the, this one, we call it an inner, inner, an inner if statement. This is an outer if statement. We can, we, we, the same thing is going to apply when we get to um, things like for, for loops, while loops, iterations. When you get to that part, the same concept are, will also be applicable. And then, Let's say the guess is right, 100, right? So it's going to say your guess is correct. If you noticed, all the all the uh, uh, outputs were printed when I was testing the diff when I was using when I was using different test cases. Then we're going to have um, we're going to have um, uh, what is it called? I think it's a multi-line. If, is it multi-line if statement or? Yeah, just we can also have multiple. We can also have um, if else if statements. So if else if statements, the way they work, right? It's like this. You say if this condition, if this condition is true, then do that thing. Else if this, now you're introducing another condition. It's different from this condition now. This is now another condition. And then at the end of the day, you can also have an else, meaning that all the above conditions were not met. And you can have multiple else if. There's nothing stopping you. You can have an else if there, else if again, and then at the end of the day, you're gonna have an else. So this is, um, and if else if statement, you have con you have multiple. So how would I say, how would I put it? And you are checking different conditions, and only one of these conditions should be true, right? So let's continue with our guessing game. Let's uh, upgrade it a bit. So let's say the number um, is equal to zero. If it's if the number is equal to zero, I'm gonna output um, um, the number 
you entered is zero. Something like that. And then another condition would be, let's say if the number is greater than zero, that means it's positive, right? So it says out the print line, the number is positive, positive. And then another condition, if number is less than zero, we know the number is negative. Number is, the number is negative. But this part, this else if, it doesn't really, we don't need it because a number can either be equal to zero, positive or negative. So I only need the else because a number can only satisfy three conditions, especially integers. It can be equal to zero, exactly zero, or positive, which means greater than zero or negative. So I only need an else if and an else. So if it's equal to zero, execute this. If it's greater than zero, that means it's positive. And then else, else means that it's not equal to zero. It's not positive. That means it can only be what? Negative. So therefore the else part is going to be the number is negative. The number is negative. So that you can say the number is positive, the number is negative. So as you can see, this is how you would structure um, an if statement with an else if. So else if just means if this condition wasn't met, can you please look at a different condition and another condition? But this condition needs to be related to the other conditions, right? So let's just test it out. There we go. So let's enter uh, the value zero. The number we've entered is zero and it stops there. That's the beauty of it. If statements, remember if statements, no matter how many conditions you have, the first condition to be true is the condition that will be executed. If it doesn't find, it will keep looking at different conditions until it, the value you've entered satisfies one of the conditions. So let me enter a big value, positive value. So you see the number is positive. Let's enter a negative value, negative 10. The number is negative because it's less than zero. And as you can see, I didn't do an else if condition saying number is less than zero. There's the else. Remember else what it means. It means neither of the conditions above were met. So I, it wasn't zero. That means it wasn't equal to zero. The value wasn't greater than zero. That means the value can only be what? Negative. So that's the else part. Then I execute the number is negative. So now let's do grades, right? So let's create an application that gets the grade from the user and use multiple if else statements. So the first condition is if your grade happens to be greater than or equals to 90. And remember, I'm only gonna have one statement or one line within a condition. So I'm not gonna put curly braces for all for all the else ifs, for all the for all the if statements that I'm going to have, because I'm going to have one statement within uh, within the within the block within the if statement block. What is an if statement block? This part. You see all of this part. This is the block that forms part of this if statement. So for each block, I'm only going to have one line or one statement. So I'm not going to put curly braces. So sys out. And then I'm going to say, um, I'm going to output A. You got an A if you got 90% and above. And then I'm going to have an else if grade is greater than or equals to 80. That means your value is, is less than 90, but it's greater than or equals to 80. So it's between 80 and 89. So you're going to get a grade of, so sys out, you're going to grade, get a grade of B. And then else if grade is greater than or equals to 70. And then sys out, you're gonna grade, get a grade of C, grade C. And then, no, this should be a mark, not grade. The grade is what I'm outputting. 
Um, you need to make you need to use the right variables so that your application is easy to read. So if it's greater than or equals to 60. Uh, out it's greater than or equals to 60. Um, this is uh, D and then I'm just going to have an else. I'm just going to call it an else. Whatever value you have, it's as long as it's less than 60. It's going to be an F. Remember that we always, for some weird reason, they skip the letter E, so it's going to be an F. So this, this, this if statements, uh, multi line or multiple if statements. So what happens is you say if, if this condition is true, if this is true, or this returns true. So what I'm, remember what happens, this returns a truth value of true or false. So if it's true, that means after evaluating this, I should get back true. So if true, then should execute this. So I need to put a condition that's going to give me back a true, a true or false value. So I need to use this um, the greater than or equals to or less than equals to or two equal signs. I need to use those operators. So let's test it out. So let me enter my mark. Let's say I got 95, right? That should be an A. There we go. I got an A. It's working as intended. So let's say I got less. I got 55. I got less than 60. That should be an F. There we go. There's the F. And then let's say I got this, uh, distinction 80% and above. So let's say I got 84. That should be a B. And then it's working as intended. Let's say you got 70% uh, and above. Let's just say you got 70 on the dot. That should be a C. There's the C and then the D, you got 60% and above. So let me get, let me say I got 69. It's a D and then everything is working as intended. So there's our if statements. But then there's one annoying thing about this. Imagine you have multiple if statements. Imagine that there's a lot. So you're going to have a lot of if, else, if, if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, if, and then eventually you get an else at the end. So now there's a more comp no, a more portable way of writing this if statement. So how do you how do you write this if statement in a more portable way? We're going to use what we call a switch statement. A switch statement is basically an if statement, but it's it's more it's more readable it's more easy yeah it's more readable it's more easy to read compared to having this this looks very untidy and it becomes very complicated as time goes on so let me do the switch statement so switch you and then the value that you put here it could it should either be a char character a byte i think it should be can be a byte byte short int or a string. These are the data types that you can put here. Any variable of this data type, you should put it there on the switch statement. So what this part means, it means uh, look at the value, right? That's what it means. So whatever variable I put here, it's gonna look at, it, at the value of that variable. And if I look at my variable, it's of type what? Int, so it meets the condition. So I'm gonna say mark, so switch and then I put Kelly braces there. Um, so how do you sort of like do an if statement? So the way you do it, you just say case like this, which basically means if if mark has this value. So if mark is um, 90. If mark is 90 like this. OK, why isn't it? If mark is 90 like this and then output. Output um, the grade, right? So you output the grade like that. Um, but in our case, we don't. Let me see case. Let me see. Can you? Let me see. Uh, I want to check something. OK, let's um, let's do a different. Let me see. Let's do a different 
problem statement, right? Let's solve a different problem, but you can sort of do rewrite this in this way. Um, so let me see. Let's say we. What, what what do we want? What problem should we solve? Something a bit straightforward. So let me get a number. For, let me call it number. So let's call it number. So I'm going to get a value from the user, a number. And then let me see. What, pro what, what, what can you solve for this problem? OK, so let's just sort of like mimic the, the one, the, the one you're previously working with. But this one is going to be slightly different. If you have 90, it's an A. If you have 80, it's a B. If you have uh, 70, it's a C. If you have 60, it's a D. If you have 50, it's an F. So we're going to work with that for now. And then once you are done, don't forget to break. So you should, you should always write it like this. You always write with you always write what you want to execute there. It could be a for loop, it could be anything. But in our case, you just want to print um, a grade, right? So once I'm done, I need to have another case, case 80, and then says out, and then grade is B, and then break. Break it means that if this case is met and you've, you are done here, just break, stop, just leave, just exit the switch statement, which is the same as an if statement. Remember an if statement, if that condition has been met, it only executes the part of the, the, the code within that, that, that if statement block, and then it leaves, it's, it, it stops executing the rest. So in order for us to do the same, with the switch statement, I have to put in the key, put in the keyword break. It means break. It's like break from this thing. Stop executing. Stop looking at other cases. So we're gonna call these cases case what case what. We're gonna call them cases. So when you put the break, it means don't look at the cases below because this case has been met. If you don't put the break, it's gonna keep continuing and checking all the cases, which becomes a problem. So case seventy. And then sys out, and then grade C, and then break, and then case 60, sys out, and then grade is D. We can, I can put it as a case. Let me see. Yeah, let me just put it as a case. Let's, let, let, me, let, me, let me not put it as a case. The one way you get 50 and whatever. So let's just say the default, if, the default, default, what you remember, if you know what default means, the keyword default, what it means, it means default, right? So by default, this should happen. So default means that none of the cases above were met. So in a way, this part, you can view it as the else in an if statement. That's what it means. So it's an else. So that's what default means, else. That means none of these cases were met. So else, the default, what's the default it's gonna be? F. So this is how you do a switch statement. And you can also put Kelly braces if you want. You can also do it like this and then put everything within here. And then outside of the Kelly brace, that's where you're gonna have to put the break. So that this is the two ways of doing it. You can do it like this. Um, yeah, you can do it like this. I think it should be like this. Yeah, the break should be outside. And then within the Kelly brace, if you have, let's just say you have more than one line of code, right? So obviously you're gonna need Kelly braces. So you put the Kelly braces like that. In our case, we only have one line, which is this one. It's one line, so I don't need the Kelly braces. So I'm gonna do undo. So let's enter, let's test for all the cases, right? So let me open my terminal and then enter 90, A as expected. And then let's run it again, 80, that should be a B. Um, okay, let me run it again. I stopped it from running, so that should be a B. There's the B, 
and then um, 70, that should be a C, 60, that should be a D. Yeah, you see the problem. Yeah, uh, at least I did, uh, at least I did, uh, did make a mistake there. You see the problem with not putting a break statement. You see at case 60, right, there's no break. So it's going to continue and execute the default, whatever cases are below it. In this case, it's the default case, which is to output the character F or the grade F. So I need to put the break there and say, once you've dealt with this break from this switch statement, leave this switch statement. You are done with whatever you execute it. So let's execute it again, 60. And now you see it shows only the grade D. And then now let's enter a value other than 90, 80, 70, 60. So let's say you got zero, that's an F. And then let's say you got, um, let's say you got 50, that's still an F. It's, it's neither the cases that, or the values that we've entered, we've entered the cases, there they are. So that's how you do a switch statement. And then there's also, then the last thing, I don't know how long this session has been recording, but I think it should suffice now. I should end soon. I don't want to make it too long. Um, okay, it's not showing the timestamp. So let's let's um, remove the switch statement. So with the switch statement, right? Um, we are done with switch statement. That's how it works. That in basic terms, that's how it works. So now let's do um, a con what you call a conditional operator or a ternary operator. So it is called a ternary operator because there's three operands. Remember, operands is values that are being operated on. So if I say x plus y, x and y are my operands. So x is an operand. Basically, the value being operated on. You can imagine, like, um, you can imagine, like, um, yeah, you are a doctor, right? So you are you are performing a, performing an operation on a person. So X would be the person. The person would call that an operand. The person being operated on. The person whom the doctor is doing the operation on. And then. The plus is what type of operation? Am I doing a kidney operation, a heart operation, a, a lung operation, an eye operation? In simple terms, that's what that's what it means. So operand, the value being operated on. And then plus is the, the operation. What type of operation are you operating? This is a plus operation. You can imagine, let's say plus represents kidney operation. So let's say this doctor is doing a kidney operation. So he's operating on your two kidneys. So the person being operated on is the operand. And then the operation, the, 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 the operation that's being done is called the operation. Simple, simple terms. That's what you are doing. So these are the terms that you need to know. So we have X and Y, the op which are the operands, and then we have plus, which is the operation. So we have the conditional operator or the tenary, oper tenary operator. It's called tenary operator because there's three operands, or there's three things that are being of which are being operated on. So in simple terms, a tenary operator is like this, right? It's a simple if else statement, but it's 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 a shorthand. For, his, for an if else statement. It's basically like the, the shortcut for writing a, an if else statement. Let's say you want to find the maximum between two values, right? So let's say I'm gonna have int um, um, num, let's say int num two and int num one. So these are two values you're gonna get from the user. Scan dot next int like this, and you want to find the maximum between the two values. You can do it this way. 
I can say um, int max, and then just initialize set set the variable to zero. Initialize the variable to zero, and then say if num one is greater than num two, then I know. Okay, I don't need curly braces because I'm gonna have one line. So then I know my max is my is num one, and then else max is gonna be num two and then semicolon so that's how you can find and store the maximum but i shouldn't say else i should say else if like this num2 is greater than because it's also equal if num2 is the one that's greater than num1 then i should set my max to num2 so this is how you can do it right you can write it like this. And if you check how many lines I've used, it's one, two, three, four. I've used four lines. I can I can uh, I can reduce this to just one line. How do I do that? So you use a ternary operator, right? So it has it has uh, these things. It has a question mark and a colon. So how do we represent that? So the question mark is the question that you're asking. Remember what a question mark does. If you did English, and you I'm sure you're supposed to have done English. Um, so how do you do it? You you write a what is this? You write a question. What's the question? You put, you're always gonna have, the best way to to write this ternary operate. Always put the question in brackets. So I'm gonna say num one is greater than num two. That's the question that I'm asking. So I'm going to put the question mark there at the end. Let me let me delete this here. I'm going to put the question mark at the end. So basically what I'm doing is I'm asking this question, is num1 greater than num2? If it is, then this is the true part. If it's not, then this is the false part. So if it's true, what should I do? I should take the value of, I should just uh, return the value of num1. So here it's going to be num. One, if it's false, I should just return the value of num2. If it's false, that means num2 is one that's big. So I'm going to store it there. So this if statement is, this, is equivalent to writing it in this way. So you should be aware of the ternary or conditional operator. So let's just delete this and then find the max and then output the maximum. So I'm going to say the max. Uh, between between what values num one and and then num two and then plus is equals to that max that um that I've calculated. So let me um run my application. So let's enter two values, two integers, right? So twelve and thirty. So num2, it should be greater. 30 should be greater than 12, right? So the max between 12 and 30 is 30. As you can see, my application is working as intended. So let's say the first value is the one that's great. So that's the biggest. So 45 and 2. So num1 should be the one that's bigger. So the, the max between 45 and 2 is equals to 45. So as you can see, my application is working as intended. I could have written this using an if else statement, but that's going to have a lot of lines of code. Why don't I just abbreviate it like this? And as you can see, the nice part about this ternary operator, it returns a value. As you can see, I've returned a value here, and that, that return value is going to be stored inside the max variable. If it's false, then it's going to return it's going to return this value and then store it inside the max variable. So this is how the tenor operator operates. So we have the condition here that we're asking the question for. And then if, if the condition is true, do that. And then if the condition is false, do that. So this is how the tenor operator is structured. If true, do this part. If false, then return this. So these are all the selections, different selections you need to know and the different tricks behind them. So I think that should be it 
for today. Um, and remember, there's different operators, right? Oh, that we discussed. There's the greater than or equals to, then we have the less than or equals to, then we have the greater than, we have the less than, we have the not equals to, we have the equals to. So these are the different uh, operators that you can use to um, calculate or find a value. Let's say we, we the value, the input is restrictions. We can use these Boolean um, operators to restrict our input and say, OK, it should be within this range. Or it shouldn't be equal to this. So these are the different operators that you can, Boolean operators that you can work with in Java. And also keep note of the ternary or conditional operator. Let me see, but I don't think it should give you much problems if you don't put yeah, you, you don't give you problems if you don't put the brackets, but brackets make it, you know, like it packages everything, makes it easier to read. So let's see, 110. Yeah, the max is 100. And then uh, 10, 3, the max is 10. Yeah, it's still working as usual, but if you check your, doc, your, your documentation or the textbook, it has, it, it, write, it always um, writes it inside uh brackets so that's it for today um that's all you need to know um in, in terms of um selection we have if statements we have a single if statement we have an if else statement we have if else if statements and we have multiple um we can also have multiple if statements right remember that there's no limitation to if statements you can have an if statement here, and then you have another if statement here. The difference between this if statement, remember when you had the if and else if statement, it only executed one of the conditions. If it's like this, if, if multiple if, sta if statements that are separated, it's going to execute all of them. So yeah, just keep that in mind. You. Just keep that in mind. If you write multiple if statements, it's going to execute every single if statements, every 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 single if statement. So that's all you need to know about Java. Um, I think I don't know whether I should talk about it now. Okay, I'll just talk. I'll just talk about it in the next um in the next lecture. Uh, the other different components of Java because I wanted to talk about um subtraction addition um uh, multiplication division um um remainder division or uh, the the modulus operator to find the remainder we'll talk about them in the next lecture i don't want to bombard you with uh too much information uh thank you for watching see you in the next lecture